We're back to the Neil Haley Show here on the Caregiver Dave Celebrity Segment. I'm excited to welcome the part of Caregiver Dave and Sandy. Dave, how are you? What's going on? And I'm excited about our guest because, again, I grew up Me watching too. this uh, candid camera when I was a kid. And I remember I was very young watching. And our guest was very young when he first was on candid camera. And the camera was huge. I was watching it from six years old up through my teen years and after that. And you know you're big when Bill Cosby in his comedy routine says, am I on candid camera? Everybody knew what candid camera was. So we have with us today, Peter Funt. Welcome to the show, Peter. Yeah, I've got you guys beat. I've been watching <laughs> candid camera since I was maybe one year old. So uh, oh. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been a part of my life, my family's life. And uh, thank goodness it just keeps on going. You know, uh, next year will be the 75th anniversary wow. of this great idea that my dad had back in on radio in 1947. And, so, and tell me uh, about the party what, and the celebration. What are we going to do? <laughs> well, it's a book party. So I, I'm happy oh. to have written my book and uh, I'll be celebrating all the way into next year. <laughs> well, I'm very great. disappointed it's not a television uh, special. I think that would work very well. You know, we hold so many records, my dad and I, in television. For example, I mean, here's a good one. We are the only entertainment show in television history to have produced new <coughs> episodes in eight different <coughs> decades. Now, wow. that's a remarkable accomplishment. There's one news show that qualifies that way, and that's NBC's Meet the Press. But with Meet the Press, Candid Camera, the only two shows produced in eight different decades. So. That's wow. a record for sure. But to answer your question about anniversaries, I don't know who keeps track of this, but we probably also hold a record for anniversary shows <laughs> because my dad did a 25th anniversary show on ABC, a 35th anniversary show on NBC. He and I did a 40th anniversary special on CBS. Yes. And then I did a fifth special on CBS that sort of launched me into a weekly series that I'm so grateful for. So, of course, why not do a 75th anniversary special? No. I don't know I'm how ready. old you are, Peter, yeah, but you look amazing for however age you are. <laughs> oh, well, I, I used to think I look good for 92, huh? <laughs> so let's let's go. Let's go, Peter. I want to jump into this specifically the history of Candy Camera in a way, before we get to the history of your life. And you talked about it started out in radio. I never knew that. So how can, how was your dad able to come up with the visuals of Candy Camera on radio? Well, he didn't, it, he didn't, he didn't even think in television terms. Uh, you know, it came about by accident. In the mid forties, my dad was in the military and at an army base in Oklahoma, his job was to record messages that the soldiers could send home to their loved ones. The messages were recorded on some kind of acetate disc and the discs were rather expensive back then. So my dad had the guys rehearse their little statement. And when they had it down pat, the red light would go on to indicate recording and they would do it. Well, what happened was one soldier after another did a great rehearsal, but then became nervous and tongue-tied during the real take. My dad's solution to this problem was to secretly disconnect the red light and secretly record the rehearsals. And after he did that in the military for a while, he realized, hey, maybe there is something to this idea of hidden audio. So when he got home, he uh, pitched it to Mutual Radio first, and they didn't buy it, but then ABC Radio did. And so in 1947, the show called Candid Microphone went on the air on ABC as a weekly radio wow. series. Wow. And it was just conversation. There were no pictures. 
But that came quickly. The very next year, 1948, it went to television and was the very first program ever televised on what became the ABC television network. And uh, then that was Candid Camera. Wow. What Are you writing all this true. down? I am. <laughs> I have a photographic memory. I'll remember all this stuff and then and talk about it another time. I won't remember, people, remember people's names. I remember people's stories. That's really weird. I guess it's probably because I interview so many people, but I can remember any conversation I have. And this is just amazing. And it's something I might bring up in social audio world, Peter, with the new revolution of social audio, Clubhouse and other platforms, Facebook audio and Twitter spaces that audio has come back and to think, and people are liking that format again, but to think that Candid Camera started out as audio and it's just amazing because we, we just go through full circle in media all the time, don't we, Peter? The funny thing is that for several years after it left, well, it didn't leave radio, it, it sort of segued into television, but for several years they retained the name Candid Microphone, even on TV. It wasn't until the show went to NBC in late 1949 that they came up with the term Candid Camera. And of course, that works a lot better alliteratively and uh, visually. So let's talk about the Nielsen ratings. Your show had huge ratings and you kept changing networks because I guess one network says, well, the ratings aren't good enough. And another, well, I'll take you, you know. Um, in the end, uh, I don't even remember what year you stopped uh, being on television, but how, how low were the ratings when you were finishing? Because I can't imagine them being that low. I, I mean, wow. everybody was that's a candid a, camera fan. That's about the most backhanded question I think I've ever heard. How low were your ratings <laughs> when you ran out of gas? Uh, I'll try to answer that. You were like 50 years ago on, yeah. on the air. No? Let me, let me uh, answer that this way. We have never considered ourselves done with candid camera. Good. The, the term I favor that we use in TV is resting. We are resting the format, waiting. Our next opportunity. So Village Roadshow Entertainment, they're a pretty good Hollywood company. And we're working on the next new version of oh, Candid awesome. Camera. And I hope we can announce a deal with the network pretty soon. So that's part of my answer. The, prior to that, the last time I was doing Candid Camera new production for television was six years ago on the TV Land channel. And Mayim Bialik and I, Mayim from the Big Bang Theory, okay. Mayim and I co-hosted that version of Candid Camera. And I, I actually think it was some of the best stuff uh, in our library, but the audience for TV Land is not very big, which comes around to your question about ratings. Uh, on, we were one of TV Land's biggest shows. Wow. And, you know, as we used to say in New York, that plus a token would get you a subway <laughs> ride. It was, we were the biggest show on a tiny, tiny platform. Uh, so, so that, that was a little, um, the underwhelming fish in the little pond. Yeah. yeah. When, when I was on CBS, uh, and I had my weekly series for three and a half years, Suzanne Summers was my co-host then I we were, that. we won the night on Friday night quite often. And we were, uh, at the top of the ratings. So, um, you know, Candid Camera's ratings, to the extent anyone cares, has kind of ebbed and flowed. But we're lucky because our material has now crossed so many generations of viewers yeah. and uh, so many different fans of different ages and all that. I, I, I don't think audience is our problem. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to get back. And a lot of people have tried to copy it. And, you know, had limited success, but there's only one candid camera. Yeah, I think it's fair to say if imitation is indeed the sincerest form of flattery, <laughs> my dad and I were just flattered beyond our wildest imagination. 
They're, so like, they're, yeah. But that's a funny thing too. For the first four decades of my dad's experience with Candid Camera, there wasn't a single imitator. 40 years of television and not a single derivative show, no one doing hidden camera that I know of. Right. And, and even that created a problem. You'd say, well, that's great. You know, we don't have any competition, but the Emmys didn't have a category for it. So we couldn't <laughs> win an award. And the critics didn't quite know how to pigeonhole it or relate to it. So sometimes their opinions were mixed or at least confused. But then when someone else started fiddling with hidden camera, it was sort of a dike that we couldn't keep our finger in anymore. And it did indeed pour out. For a while, my father tried suing some of these imitators. And that didn't work out too well because you can't really protect this sort of idea. Right. Obviously, the name Candid Camera is fully protected, but the notion of hiding a camera is not protectable, nor should it be. I, I, I'm, happy, I'm happy that so many people have tried. And I'm also happy that most all of them have, in my opinion, somehow failed. Uh, it's not that complicated, but they don't really manage to capture the essence of what my dad invented and what I have tried to do in my career. And, and I can sum it up. It's to celebrate humanity. We don't come at candid camera with the notion that people are stupid or that we can make them look that way. We think people are great sports. We think when we tell them, smile, you're on candid camera, it is in most cases, one of the happiest moments of their entire life. So we're positive. And, uh, and if that makes us different from our imitators, then the heck with them. You know? yeah, I remember one particular episode. I'm sorry, Neil, I got to take over here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I've been in the gas station business for, for years. My family's been in it. And you did a skit one time where uh, people would come into the gas station and you had the camera hidden and they would ask for the restroom key and you would give them the key attached to like a tire. <laughs> just, yeah, I'm sorry, but, you know, people steal the key, but uh, they can't steal this one. You remember? Doing I that? sure do. Um, it's one of my personal favorites. And I was uh, there that day that we, we shot that. It's so beautiful because you see, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Dave, because that is the essence of a perfect candid camera idea. It's not a big deal. It's not, you know, uh, uh, dropping a piano out of a 10th floor window or something. Right. It's, it's a simple little idea, but that almost 100% of us can relate to very easily. Uh, it's very much like when Jerry Seinfeld says, you know, is non-fat yogurt really fat free? Yeah. It's, it's in the zeitgeist. It's the stuff we think about and experience. So that experience at the gas station with the, they put the key on big things like a, a wrench or something like that. We just magnified it for comedic effect. Right. But Dave, if you're a fan of gas station humor, our library is loaded with gas oh, station really? stuff. I must have missed it. My <laughs> Where could I see that stuff? My dad did the 18-foot dipstick. <laughs> so the attendant is pull, trying to check the oil, <laughs> and the dipstick is 18 feet long. Uh, I sent... Kate McNamara of our staff into a gas station once and asked her to to ask the guy, would you take out five gallons? <laughs> That's it. Just can you remove five gallons? That's a big, big problem for a guy who takes his gas station work seriously. Absolutely. <laughs> I sent Melissa into another gas station and she asked the guy, would you change the air in my tires? I'm, I'm convinced it's become very dirty over time. 
Uh, many, many gas station gags. Don't get me started. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so That's let's awesome. talk about the jingle, Smile, You're on Candid Camera, which I'm not going to sing. Dave's a, more of a singer, I think, than me. But uh, how did that jingle come about? It came about out of a very serious need in about 1963. The show had already been around for 15 years and it did not have the slogan, smile, you're on candid camera yet. And it did not have that song. It had an instrumental song, uh, not memorable. But in, in that year, 63, my father was facing a very serious problem. He was a top 10 rated show on network television, but the critics would not get off his back. Too many people wrote that Candid Camera is cruel or treats people unfairly. And that was the, the predominant view at that time. So he and his staff set about trying to create a marketing tool that would fix this problem. And some smart person in the room said, well, when you take a picture, a still picture, you tend to say, smile. Why don't we say smile in connection with candid camera? And from that came the slogan, smile, you're on candid camera, which by the way, let me interrupt myself. As I mentioned in my book, we got an award from a national plumbing supply company because they had figured out that smile you're on candid camera is the most popular graffiti above restroom urinals smile you're on candid camera yes so, i've seen that <laughs> but but then to uh extend the idea from the uh slogan they got some talented guys to write a song to go with it that became the new theme song that has lasted with us till this day. And that in turn led to more of what my dad and I called reveals, those happy moments when we said, smile, you're on candid camera, and people realized it was a joke and they were on TV. But it all worked together, the slogan and the term and, and the reveal. And boy, I'm so happy that accident took place. Uh, I got to ask you, were there some people who were not happy, that were mad? Yeah, I'd be lying if I said that never happened. Of course, it had to when we photographed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Usually, the people who decline to sign a release, and that's what you're talking about, because they, they, they do have to sign a waiver to give us permission to use it on TV. And usually the people who decline are people we photographed who were in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong other person. <laughs> oh, so if you photograph someone who's out on a date with someone else's wife, you're not gonna get a release no matter how funny it is. And that happens once in a while. I once shot a sequence or tried to at a restaurant in Darien, Connecticut on a Saturday night. Now, Darien is a so-called uh, bedroom community for New York City guys. And I know now what they mean by bedroom community because that <laughs> night in that restaurant, 12 out of 14 couples we photographed wouldn't sign because they were there inappropriately. So I, I learned a bit of a lesson that night. Yeah. Otherwise, Dave, to be honest with you, people are thrilled. You know, do you remember on Family Feud, not the current one, but the original yes. with Richard Dawson? Yes. Right. And do you remember how he, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, he's sort of like Andrew Cuomo, but he, <laughs> he was kissing all of the right. contestants. Who and loved you remember it, how way. that built over time? At first, it was, if you look back on the original shows, it was mildly awkward. By the end of his run, it was the best thing that could possibly happen. People were thrilled to get a hug and a kiss from Richard Dawson. So 
that's the same thing that happened with Candid Camera. It was self-fulfilling. The bigger the show got, the more successful it became, the more of a thrill it was to finally be caught. Who would decline to be on? We've had people who declined and then came back to our location an hour later and saying, what was I thinking? My kids are going to kill me. I got a sign. Yeah. Wow. So three years old is the first time you walked on set. You were on can of camera. Yeah. So did you write? My that? dad thought that I could be a shoeshine boy at age three on the streets of New York City. And there was no great joke, except that I was told to charge $10 per shoe. <laughs> Back at a time when I guess a shine cost 15 cents or something for both shoes. And they just wondered how people would react to such an audacious and young entrepreneur. Uh, I'm told it was moderately funny, but I also learned sadly that they didn't bother to keep the footage back then. Oh. They, they didn't keep, they never kept the outtakes, it, but they edited the piece and threw everything else away. Then the show was telecast and then they threw the show away. Wow. They didn't even bother keeping that. So fortunately, a few years later, you know, they started saving stuff and we have a great library. But back then, no, I, it's only it's only the memories of my family members that uh, allow me to tell that story. But yeah, that was yeah. my first experience. And uh, on and off throughout my youth, I was plugged in to candid camera situations. It was often a time when my dad couldn't get one of the professionals to do something because it was either too outlandish, too uh, stupid, or too dangerous. Now on the cover of my book, and here's the plug, but can you see this? I don't want to glare into the camera. Yes. Yes. But, but that's an actual photograph when I was 15 years old, and what you see there is, this, this isn't Photoshop or anything. I am hanging from the ceiling in what my dad thought could be an upside down room. And he took everything that should have been on the floor, <laughs> desk, chair, lamp, everything, and fastened it upside down to the ceiling. But in order to complete this effect, he needed someone young enough, nimble enough, dare I say stupid enough to <laughs> hang upside down and talk to people when they came into this room. Now, what we learned right away was you can only do this for 60, 70 seconds or so. And then the bl blood rushed to my head and some big guys had to come in and bring me down. Oh my. And then I'd walk around till I felt okay. <laughs> okay, and then back up. And we did this all day long. It was like a eight to nine hour shoot. Wow. And not a blasted funny thing ever happened. Uh, we got a good photo out of it. And that made the cover of my book. But the reactions were terrible. And I'll tell you why. Uh, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists refer to it as a cognitive dissonance. They people were so stunned by what they were seeing that they just sort of sh shut down. And instead of being the great reaction that my father anticipated, there was actually no reaction. They just wow. ran out of the room. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> they didn't talk to him and engage. They just ran out of the well, room. Well, him was me. Him you, would, yes. would have been me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And they did a little bit, but it, you know how Gleason used to say, I'm dating myself, but you know how Jackie Gleason used to say, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a. Yes, yes, yes. That's what I got that day. <laughs> so you got to have at least the top three fantastic skits that you've ever done that are in the Hall of Fame. What are they? That's a tough question, not a bad one, but a tough one because there's so many thousands and they're in so many different categories, this kind of apples and oranges. A lot of people used to tell my dad, I'll start with him. They used to say that his two most iconic sequences were the talking mailbox shot in 
1949, oh my. mailbox on the street, talk to people. That was it. But remember, back then, that the, you didn't have, well, let me say today, everything talks to us. You know, right. your car talks, your microwave oven talks, your everything talks. Back then, the idea of a talking mailbox was just crazy. Another one that he, that he gets a lot of credit for in, in a historical view is one that I participated in, in a small way. It was called the car without a motor. And it was a car that had the engine removed oh and then was towed to the top of hills. And so Dorothy Collins, who was the performer oh, in that sequence, was able to guide, roll really, the, the car down the hill and into service stations where she asked guys to check, you know, check under the hood and there was nothing there. And that too was almost a homina homina moment, but we got some very good stuff that day. In fact, I, I recreated that about six years ago we went back to the very same spot in Yonkers, New York, where we had shot it the first time. And this time, my son, Danny, who's also part of the show now, uh, took over my role. And the actress, Megan Hilty, took uh, Dorothy Collins' role. So those are probably two of my dad's favorites. Um, as for me, I think the two in my uh, th thousands that I've done, one was a thing called the Butomatic. And I discussed this in the book. Uh, I built a fake machine that I claimed could do a complete beauty makeover in just a few seconds. And all it had to be done was the woman would be put on a conveyor belt, roll into the machine, and just a few seconds later would roll out the other end, fully made up and hairstyle and everything. So in order to do this, I built this fake machine and I hired the magician's best friend, identical twins, so that one actresses, so that one twin unmade up could go in one end and then a little while later, her twin sister, fully made up, would roll out the other end. I did this for professionals. They were called one at a time to this showroom where I would be demonstrating this machine. And I had this woman to, to demonstrate one of our twins, but they didn't realize that. And so the subjects, as we call them, the unsuspecting people, were these professional beauticians. And I think that's important because we didn't just pull this prank on you know, some average person off the street. These were professionals in the beauty business. And one after another, they said, wow, how much does that cost? And <laughs> where can we get one of those machines? And can I try it? But as I mentioned in my book, the reveal, for one of those beauticians is one of the most poignant moments in candid camera history. The tw first twin comes out fully made up, the professional beautician falls for it. I do the reveal and I signal and the other twin comes out. So now the beautician sees two twins standing next to each other and me saying, this is candid camera. And she says, I knew it. I knew it. And I say, no, you knew nothing. <laughs> and she turns to one of the twins and says, did you know? Now process that. That underscores, first of all, the reality of our <laughs> reality show because this was no setup. She was so confused, so nonplussed, so uh, caught in the moment that she not only believed it, but she wondered if one of our two actresses knew about the joke. So oh, wow. that's oh. one of my best moments, Dave.
That's all awesome. Right. So Dave, we, we uh, could talk all day. No, I know you're now we're ready for your final question. Dave has a caregiving question. <laughs> then wait a minute. Follow. The question is about my book, right? You want to know <laughs> all about self amused, I assume. Yeah, we're going to ask that. No, that's going to be the last <laughs> question where we can get the book, Peter. But <laughs> okay. let's Dave has a question about caregiving. That's interesting. Go ahead, Dave. Go What's ahead. a question, Dave? I'm sorry, I accidentally hit that. All right, last question. Uh, second to the last question, I'm sorry. Um, I am a caregiver, my wife had a stroke. I know there's a change of topic, and, uh, but she's, she's doing good. She still can't talk. She can communicate though, non-verbally. And I've been dealing with this for 25 years, but she's reinvented herself. She's doing good, you know, we have a new normal. And now I go around helping other caregivers because I realize how difficult it is to, you know, survive this thing. 30% of caregivers die just from the, the stress. I'm sure you're no stranger to uh, caregivers and stress. Uh, I know your father um, is no longer with us. I don't know, you know, if he went through a prolonged um, uh, illness or whatever, but have you ever uh, had experience with having to get care for another person? My dad suffered a debilitating stroke in 1993 and that forced him into retirement. I was his caregiver along with some other very mm -hmm. helpful people for the next six years to one degree or another. I had to care for him. I also had to care for his business and, and keep things going. Um, but we were able to use something he coined and and put together uh, in the mid 1980s, and that's called Laughter Therapy. Mm. And we have a nonprofit foundation called Laughter Therapy, oh, wow. continues to this day. And we send specially selected candid camera material to critically ill people mm. because we found, and smarter people than we have reported, that there's something about that humor rooted in reality that works very well to release endorphins and sure. make you feel better and maybe even uh, speed healing. You know, I'm no scientist, but we learned about this first in a book written by the late author Norman Cousins, who wrote a famous book called Anatomy of an Illness. And in that book, he described how watching Candid Camera helped in his recovery. And it was that that prompted my dad to start the Laughter Therapy Foundation. So Dave, yes, I'm very familiar with what you're going through. And uh, I, I wish you luck, but I'll also say I'll send you some laughter therapy awesome. tapes so that Thank can't you. hurt. Yeah, uh, laughter yeah. is healing to the bones. That's even in the Bible. Yep. Now, so Peter, where can we pick up your book? Show us the book again and work. Yeah, you everywhere. I hope it just came out. It's called Self Amused. The subtitle is a tell some memoir. It's not a tell all memoir. I wouldn't dare do that to some of my friends, but it's tell some. And fortunately, the sum that I do tell includes many of my favorite candid camera experiences and never before published anecdotes from behind the scenes. And it also reveals to those who would care, <laughs> whoever they are, some of the wacky things I've done in my own career besides candid camera, from selling newspapers to printing news on restaurant placemats to selling dried weeds to florists in Manhattan, to publishing a magazine and yada, yada, yada. I, I've had some of the craziest experiences and I thought this has got to go in a book if only for my kids to read someday. So that's what Self Amused is a combination of candid camera experiences and Peter Funt's nutty entrepreneurial dreams and I hope it's entertaining. You can get it anywhere, uh, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, right. Target, whatever. And I wanted That's to say awesome. one more thing, Peter, before we let you go, so that when's the anniversary again? So people can- Well, Candy Camera's 75th anniversary, if you go by the radio debut, would be uh, in about 10 months or so uh, next summer. And, um, I hope we can put together a special for that. I also hope that by then, my new partners and I are more back on weekly television. 
because, you know, candid camera is a wonderful idea. And uh, besides, it's the thing I do best. So yeah. well, <laughs> we're going to be rooting for you. We're, we're, in, we're in contact. We're going to be rooting for you. And uh, best of luck, Peter, with all your ventures. And it was such a delightful show, providing great information for fans of Canon Camera. And they need to pick up the book. So I appreciate it, Peter. Oh, thank you both. Nice to be with you guys. Thank All right, you. take care. Great. Thanks, Peter, for your thank time. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. All right, guys, that was the Caregiver Dave Celebrity segment here on the Neil Haley Show. Take care.